I was having a forum discussion earlier today, and the subject was unijunction transistors. So I thought I would make a video about them, what they were, how you would use them, how they worked, and uh, that's all in the past tense because nobody makes them anymore, nobody uses them anymore. There are a number of equivalents that are better to substitute for the same purposes. And I mean, if nothing else these days, you can put in a microcontroller for a lot of the same purposes. That's how advanced things are these days. So this is more of a historic interest kind of a thing. So the symbol of the UJT, it's a circle with a emitter coming in one side with this hooked arrow thing. It's a line and two square lines coming off of it, which are the base one and the base two, connected to the base, which is what that line in the middle is. The cartoon that you usually see is it was this chunk of silicon, this base. It could be any semiconductor, it's usually silicon in these devices. There's a diffusion on one side, and that's called the emitter, so we got a PN junction, so that looks like a diode. This base 1, base 2, I don't think the order actually matters. If you connect the emitter to one or the other or both, it just looks like a diode. The difference is, this is really long, this is a lot, there's a lot of length here, so there's a lot of resistance here, so this looks like a lot of resistance there, and a lot of resistance there. The other special thing about this, which is what gives rise to the properties that it has, is when you forward bias this diode, what you're doing is you're injecting minority carriers into the silicon. What that means is you're putting electrons and holes into here and it just starts getting kind of, it's like a waterfall, there's just kind of whoosh, stuff going everywhere. When you have all those extra charge carriers, the conductivity increases substantially. This silicon normally is lightly doped, which means that it doesn't have very many charge carriers in it to begin with, so it has a relatively high resistance, but it does have a constant resistance. It doesn't vary much with applied voltage or temperature, although there is a strong temperature dependency. But what happens is when you inject those charge carriers, this one drops its resistance significantly. If you've got a capacitor out here, let's say, then that reduction in resistance discharges the capacitor, which causes more current flow, which causes more charge carriers, which causes even less resistance. So this thing just goes thump, switches on. And if you set that up in a normal circuit like this, you've got your charging resistor, char timing capacitor, the voltage ramps up slowly until it reaches this threshold voltage. Now, because this thing is two resistors in series, basically, there's a voltage at the middle of this base, which is about halfway between these. In the data sheet for one of these devices, that ratio is well defined, as are the resistances. All of this is specified. That way, when this voltage here rises to a certain point, rather than just the voltage as a PN diode, for example. Rather, you use it as a voltage divider with this having a certain threshold voltage. And when that voltage reaches a certain point, it kind of trips, this resistance drops, and it basically switches. And if you use a relatively small resistor here so that you get this capacitor into this low resistance into this other low resistance, you get a convenient pulse output. That's a pretty typical role for a unijunction transistor. Now the similarities here, notice that the base 1, base 2 are symmetrical. It's got this wires to a base, square wires to a base shape to it. It's got this hunk of silicon with resistance to it and a PN junction in the side. All of this looks very similar to a JFET, which has just a straight triangle into it, really bad single-handed drawing there. The similarity is not coincidental because if this PN junction simply wraps around this bar of silicon, you have an N channel, and if this depletion junction here, this depletion region, expands from reverse biasing it, it cuts off 
the channel altogether, and you get amplification as a JFET, which has another important aspect. If you take a JFET, you should be able to forward bias the gate and observe a reduction in the channel resistance, which I haven't done yet, but I'll be just playing with that momentarily and see if that works. Now, UJTs aren't really available anymore today as such, except as old stock. But it occurs to me there is one other way that you can cause this charge injection effect. One way is by, if you inject charge from PN junction, it just kind of diffuses everywhere into the silicon, in particular in the direction where the current flow is, so that this whole thing reduces in resistance. That's the effect we're looking for. What else has that effect? You can apply light to silicon, and the light that's absorbed causes charge carriers to split apart. Where you have a PN junction, they just kind of get sucked into that because of there's a potential here, and that's where you get a that's where you get a solar cell. There's also another device that uses this directly. If we have a piece of semiconductor and we apply light to it. It might look something like this. This is a really humongous, ancient cadmium sulfide photocell power master. Uh, I had removed this from a, an old organ, actually. It was used for the vibrato or something like that. What this is is there's interdigitated connections over a cadmium sulfide, which is a semiconductor material, so that when it's exposed to light, the resistance drops. When it's dark, the resistance is pretty large. This thing, I think, is like a mag, and it's like hundreds of ohms when it's bright. I don't remember exactly. And of course, you get smaller ones that are used for ambient light pickup on appliances, TVs, computers, and such. So. Presumably, if you take two of these, put them in series, just like this, and you sense the voltage here by putting, let's say, a LED in series with it, and you shine the LED on this one, you'll get positive feedback. So let's go see if that works. Very simple circuit. I've got 12 volt supply on these two rails here. This is the photo cell that's grounded. This is the node between them. This is the wire going back to the supply. So we just have a voltage divider made of photo cells. At the bottom, we have an LED, which is in series with that. So that's in series with the middle node. And the other side of the LED. The LED, by the way, is a PN junction, and it is except through photoelectric effect rather than, well not photoelectric effect, but through light effect, we'll say, it is causing charge carrier injection in this photocell. So this is, as such, a unijunction transistor on the breadboard made out of commodity parts. This wire, of course, goes over to a rather large capacitor and a charging resistor and I'm just probing this with this resist this wire here. So the capacitor voltage you can see, it's a ramp. It's actually a pretty good ramp. The fall time is not very good. It's 2.6 milliseconds. So it's a very a rather slow device. Cadmium sulfide is not renowned for its speed, of course. If I shadow one of them, this is shadowing the dark one, you see the threshold voltage rises significantly. So that's pretty reasonable to expect. If I shadow the top one, you see it drops. Because the, the threshold voltage dropped, you see it's more linear in comparison, and it's also much higher frequency. And here's the circuit. Very simple as you can see. Well, thanks for watching.